This YouTube series will cover material that we cover in our Introduction to Astronomy class from a meteorite found in Antarctica from the planet Mars and the search for life, all the way through to supernovas and black holes. So, we assume that stars are different sizes, different masses, but how do we actually measure the mass of a star? I'll remind you about Kepler. Kepler liked to study orbits. So if we could watch something orbit a star, we can tell its mass based on its gravitational pull. It turns out we're in luck. It turns out that more than half the stars in the universe are binary stars. They're two star systems. So we can actually watch one orbit the other. So by studying binary star systems, we can study their orbits and therefore figure out their masses. Now, there are a number of different types of binaries. There were visual binaries, where we actually watch one star orbit another. There are also things called optical doubles. When you look up at the sky and you go, oh, look, two stars orbiting each other. But the reality is, it's an optical illusion. One star is dramatically closer or farther away than another. Those are not binaries at all. But in fact, visual binaries are fairly rare, the real ones, because it's hard to detect them. Instead, what we often do instead is we find two stars passing one in front of the other, an eclipsing binary where you can study the orbits based on the light going up and down from the eclipse. Or lastly, the most common type of binary is a spectroscopic binary where the spectrum of two stars overlap each other as it goes back and forth, back and forth. So with the use of visual spectroscopic, and eclipsing binaries, we can find our way around and study the mass. We'll throw off the, the optical doubles that are of no use to us. So we can figure out the mass of stars using binary stars. What about the temperature? You say, well, wait a minute, shouldn't we use color? Isn't that enough? Well, the reality is, in order to figure out a star's exact color, its exact peak wavelength, as we discussed before, that takes a lot of time. You have to take pictures of the star in all the different wavelengths in order to determine the exact color. It turns out in this case, we'll turn to a woman by the name of Annie Jump Cannon. Annie Jump Cannon worked at Harvard around the turn of the century. And she wasn't given a lot of opportunities because she was a woman in astronomy. And she was, I, quite frankly, discriminated against. So what happened was, uh, she was given a kind of a rather drab job. People went out each night and studied the stars and figured out their colors, and then they took the spectrum of the star to figure out their composition, and they were taking tens of pictures of each star. Before long, Amy Jump Cannon realized that she can tell based on the strength of the spectral lines what a star's temperature was. It turns out she discovered something called spectral classification. She realized that without worrying about what the exact color of the star was, she could, by the intensity of the spectral lines, tell the temperature of the star. So she invented what's called spectral classification. And in fact, she labeled the hottest stars the O stars, and then B, A, F, G, K, and M. The hottest stars are the O stars. The coolest stars are the M stars. O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. You say, why didn't she use A, B, C, D, E, F? Because those spectral lines already were named by chemistry. Within each of these is a 0 to 9. So O, 0 is the hottest star all the way down to an O, 9. In fact, our sun, the yellow sun, is a G, 2 star. So. The point is, she removed the need to take lots and lots of pictures to figure out the exact color because of this connection with spectral classification. A wonderful story. So if you put everything together so far, we have a way to measure a star's mass. And we realize there's a correlation that the hot stars are the massive stars. But they're also the short-lived stars because they're so incredibly bright. Absolute magnitudes were telling us that the biggest stars were also the shortest lived stars because they burned through their fuel so quickly. 
And what came next was a very interesting question. The question posed by two people by the name of Hertzsprung and Russell was, is there a connection between a star's temperature and its brightness? They put together what was called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram in order to determine if there was a correlation. They put on one axis a star's temperature. We measured temperature using anti-jump cannons O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. Temperature increasing in this direction. We measure brightness of a star based on absolute magnitude. The absolute magnitude of a star ranges anywhere from a number of, say, minus 10 for the brightest stars, once it's been correlated with distance, all the way to plus 17 for the dimmest. Remember our magnitude scale? For every one magnitude, it's two and a half times dimmer. There's 27 magnitudes there as we get dimmer in this direction. So absolute magnitude increasing this direction. This was the range of brightnesses of stars. And so what we did was we said, well, we'd expect that the hot stars are bright and the cool stars are dim. We'd expect something like this. We'd expect that the line on an HR diagram should look like this. When we actually plotted the data, we found that this was mostly true. In fact, about 91% of the stars, including our own sun, a G2 star, saw sit right here on this line. But we also found a curious collection of stars here and here. We labeled this line, hot and bright, cool and dim, the main sequence, and decided that stars that were sitting on the main sequence must be stars doing exactly what our sun was doing, burning hydrogen in their cores and sitting at hydrostatic equilibrium. Hot and bright and cool and dim. But what intrigued us was, what about these stars over here that were cool but bright? What would make a star cool but bright? In order for a star to be red but bright, it must be big. These were giant stars. They were not in hydrostatic equilibrium. And these stars over here, hot but dim. Hot stars are supposed to be bright, but these stars were dim they must then be significantly smaller. These were the dwarf objects, the dwarfs. They represent about 1% of stars and about 8% of stars, combined with the 91% of stars that sit on the main sequence. Before long, scientists begin to realize that these were stars that were in the process of dying. Stars spend a small percentage of their life becoming giants as they move out of hydrostatic equilibrium, exploding in supernovas and other events, and leaving behind dwarf objects. What follows from the HR diagram will be where we go next. What happens when a star runs out of fuel?